Welcome to Parallax by Anka Kalra, a podcast produced by Radcliffe Cardiology to bring you a new angle of all things cardiology and the best from the US Cardiology Review. Published every second Monday, Anka Kalra, MD, interventional cardiologist at the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio, USA, speaks with legendary cardiologists, reviews late-breaking trials, and interviews authors of our latest and best US cardiology review articles. We call them hashtag audio articles. Parallax is the effect whereby the position or direction of an object appears to differ when viewed from different positions. So this podcast is your fix of reliable updates on all things cardiology by someone from a non-traditional background who is always looking at the industry from a new angle. Now, here's your host, Anka Kalra, MD. Hello, everyone. Um, I have the distinct honor and privilege of... uh, having with me on the show today a very special guest. Um, I actually um, came to know of her uh, when I was um, a junior faculty at my previous employer. Uh, she came in as an interventional fellow. And um, then we worked for a little bit together. And then, uh, you know, I switched jobs. I went to a different employer down the street. And um, Lo and behold, uh, she's back with the same employer now. So we work for the same health system, although we are not in the same institution uh, building wise. It is my um, absolute pleasure to introduce to everyone on the show, Dr. Ann Gage. Uh, Dr. Gage is uh, an interventional cardiologist at the Cleveland Clinic. She works at the main campus. She also is an interventional intensivist. So she also works in uh, staffs patients um, in the cardiovascular intensive care unit. Uh, which, you know, I think is a very unique combination. Uh, I mean, we could probably count on our fingertips how many of such people exist, uh, you know, nationally in the United States. So um, without much further ado, I will give the microphone over to Anne. Anne, welcome on the show and thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Ankur. It's a real privilege to have this opportunity. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it, it has been my concerted effort and you know all of us at parallax you know we really wanted to feature women in medicine for season two at least to start off with you know when we were doing our search uh, you know i i brought you up because you have a unique set of skill set as well you know you are an interventionist in the cat lab but you also have gone through training not in advanced heart failure but actually in critical care medicine um so that that is an extremely unique skill set. But before we get there, you know, I think uh, it, it'll be interesting for our audience to learn more about you, you know, your upbringing, uh, where you were born and raised and how you decided to get into medicine. Sure. So I am from Dayton, Ohio, and I was born to uh, my mother, who is a corporate lawyer. Uh, my father is also a lawyer. And I think early on in life, growing up in Ohio, I think what is modeled for you is that if you really want to be successful, the sort of professional career that you see are either that of a physician or that of a lawyer. And we, I had no idea about many of the other opportunities in the world. That was sort of what was I was exposed to. And so I realized that being a lawyer looked fairly boring and that I really was interested in science and people and that ultimately led me into medicine. So I went to Northwestern for college in Chicago. I did a master's in physiology and biophysics at the uh, at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. I came home to Ohio for medical school to Cincinnati and then ultimately started my medicine training at Vanderbilt University in Nashville. And I came to Cleveland almost seven years ago for my cardiology training. And since I've been here, I've completed general cardiology. I then did a cardiac critical care fellowship. And then after that, I followed it with interventional cardiology. And that all has ultimately led me to, I guess, six or seven months ago, I came on staff as interventional cardiology staff at the Cleveland Clinic. So it's been a long, long road, but it's been pretty great. Yes. You know, it's, um, it's a lot, it's, it's, you know, um, you talk to any physician, uh, or at least a cardiologist, uh, I'm not sure I should say physician, uh, for all comers, but you know, for cardiologists who are subspecialists, you know, for the most part, all of us share a pretty long road to where we are now and, you know, the kind of work that we do. So, you know, I, so that's good. So congratulations. I, I think it's, um, kudos to you for following, um, you know, your path and, 
for for having the courage to to, to carve out an, a, a niche for you um, for yourself. Uh, tell us about um, the decision making and the roadblocks that you faced in carving out a niche as an interventional intensivist. Uh, you know because. When I was in medicine residency and I had done a residency in home in, in India before I came here, I, I repeated a residency and where I did my residency, critical care was a powerhouse. I mean, you had some of the stalwarts and the lumen, you, you, you know about this, you know, Steve Hollenberg and, and Phil Bellinger and Joe Perillo. I stand on their uh, uh, shoulders. Yes, yes. Uh, so, you know, I, I was enamored by, you know, who they were and the kind of work that they did and the kind of research that they were doing and I always wanted to be a cardiologist and, uh, you know, I, I remember having um, a sit down with, with Dr. Dellinger and, you know, and him telling me, you know, listen, if, if you really want to be a cardiologist, you know, you should, you should become one. And if you then in the future want to dabble into critical care, it's something you can do. But, you know, I think you should keep your primary interest in mind. And, you know, I think I, I went through the um, additional rotations for me to become critical care board eligible, which I am, but I never really got into, you know, taking critical care boards because I ventured into interventional and then structural heart. So but t t tell us about yourself. Tell us about your journey, about about the roadblocks and about the decision making, because I think many people uh, in the early career or even the fellow fellows in training stage who are part of the listenership would be interested to, to learn yeah. more. So I think that this was actually quite a uh, learning uh, experience for me because I think before this, everything that I've done has been fairly formulaic in the sense that we graduate high school, clear next step, you follow the application process, you go to college, everybody, you apply for medical school. We, you know, This was not a, a, a real challenge as far as figuring out how the steps should align as far as getting into residency and then fellowship, as far as general fellowship. But then I went to, as I mentioned, to Vanderbilt for residency. And Vanderbilt is a powerhouse in when it comes to pulmonology and critical care. And I realized that I was most interested by cardiology, but that I really, really admired the uh, the staff in the pulm critical care department, especially those working in the ICU. And almost as much as cardiology, I loved critical care. I just didn't really like the lungs. And so as a resident, it was, how do I merge these two interests? How can I be this ICU physician? And how can I also do cardiology? So I came to the Cl Cleveland Clinic, uh, just figuring the best thing that I needed to do was become the best general cardiologist I could. By second year, I certainly knew um, that I wanted to continue uh, to pursue my interest in critical care. And that's when I started to run into some roadblocks. Uh, interventional cardiology, if I went straight through to interventional, it's uh, one to two years, depending on where you train. And you can't do intervention and then walk away for a year or two to do critical care. And so there were going to be initially timing issues. And then there was the question of, so how do you train? And there are not uh, many programs. I, I, there are, I think, in Boston now and maybe at uh, one in California where they're starting to merge interventional and critical care together. That certainly wasn't an option for me. And so at the Cleveland Clinic where I was training, my option was to do interventional cardiology as a two-year program and the second year being really um, very structural and peripheral heavy. And I realized that that probably was not the best career path for me, that I really wanted to do critical care and then coronaries um, with a focus on mechanical circulatory support, but that the structural side and peripheral wasn't going to necess be necessary for the career path that I envisioned. And so that led me to ultimately have to look elsewhere. I am incredibly grateful for the training that the Cleveland Clinic uh, gave me, but I respect that their interventional program is a two-year program with a heavy focus on structural. And I don't think that they were quite ready at the time to, or had a full understanding of what the role of an interventional intensivist was. And so I really struggled to make the decision of whether or not I should leave the institution that had trained me so well and where I really feel at home uh, to pursue a slightly different training pathway. And ultimately, I did. I left and I went to another institution for one year, um, which ended up being great. 
And it gave me the skill set that I needed just to do coronaries. And then I did that as far as timing issues. I decided that I had to do critical care immediately after general cardiology so that I wasn't getting my interventional training and then walking away from the lab for any extended period of time. So for me, it was general cardiology followed by cardiac critical care. I was the first person at the Cleveland Clinic who's done our cardiology training at the clinic and then to do um, our critical care program. So I completed that in four years, then went and did my PGY eight year of interventional. And I came back because I think the clinic, while my training pathway isn't really one that at the time, even some places as large as the Cleveland Clinic, we weren't set up to support. Um, the Cleveland Clinic certainly has realized that this is a needed skill set. And so they brought me back as staff and uh, it's been a pretty great experience so far. That's that's incredible. So, um, so y- you know, y- you mentioned about a couple programs that are, um, you know, coming up now, or I don't know if they're established already. Um, but the, but the Cleveland Clinic it does not have a program, does not have a program um, for this pathway, right? I mean, if someone is interested to pursue the pathway of an interventional intensivist, they do not have one yet. Do, do, are there programs in the country f- with this pathway? So f- at this point, I, I can't say for sure. I have heard from uh, at different meetings that there are a couple of fellows in Boston with Naveen Kapoor and then in uh, – uh, California out of Cedars who were at least potentially, uh, that this was being entertained as training pathways for them. And, but that was as of last spring. And I'm not sure if these, uh, these general fellows went ahead and started this fall or this summer. Um, so I think that the, this, we're moving in this direction. And one of the things that I know is when we were interviewing for fellows, just our general fellowship this fall, I was frequently beckoned in the afternoon to come and talk to multiple people, many of whom wanted to have hear what my cardiac critical care experience was. But also, there was more than a half dozen uh, interviewees that who wanted to or who had an interest in doing interventional cardiology and critical care. And one of the things they, of course, all knew that this was not a pathway that I was able to pursue even at a major, major cardiovascular center. And uh, what my advice was on that and whether or not I thought it would be a uh, potential in the future. And I really do think that it is, um, but it's going to take a a critical mass of us and then some people who believe that this is a viable option. And I think that that's – it's a unique – Thing. I mean, most most interventionalists have been trained that they're in the cath lab or they're doing structural stuff in a hybrid OR. And the reality is, I think that most cardiologists think that they're pretty good at critical care without an without additional critical care training. And so you have to appeal and make a, a viable argument to a group of people who in leadership positions uh, to support this training pathway. And I think that now there's a groundswell of people from uh, the young, you know, the fellows entering who realize where this cardiac critical care world is going and that it merges very well with intervention or with heart failure. And uh, we're starting to see the buy-in from our, the leadership but it certainly has not been an overnight uh, phenomenon. Yes. Um, actually, as we record this and as we speak on this, you know, and I think I did uh, mention this to you in in passing when, when we've uh, had a conversation ear- early on, um, uh, is that there is a paper in review in Jack, um, you know, as we speak, uh, which talks about this pathway. It's t- it talks about the pathway of the interventional intensivist. Uh, I've written it with... Uh, with one of the former residents at, uh, at UH and, um, um, who's, who's now a cardiology fellow at, at Tulane and, and, uh, with, with another interventional cardiologist. And, uh, you know, we've been back and forth with the Jack editors. So, you know, just, um, uh, hone in on your point on, uh, you know, buy-in from the leadership and, you know, we've been trying to justify the pathway of an interventional intensivist in this manuscript. And, you know, we've uh, actually compared it with that of, a heart failure intensivist um, or interventional heart failure, which are different than interventional intensivist. Um, because, you know, maybe the, the pathway which you mentioned with Naveen Kapoor is, is I know it's an interventional heart failure. So that would um, get you the skill sets to be an advanced heart failure cardiologist or a, 
uh, and a transplant cardiologist along with being an interventionalist. But I don't think that that equates into being a critical care doctor. What do you think? I mean, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, I think that, you know, when you step back and you look at why this is necessary at this point, just in general from cardiac critical care, when you look at the in, kind of the inception of cardiac ICUs, these were to deal with immediate resuscitation efforts after myocardial infarctions. And we now know that the cardiac critical care population is much less uh, a myocardial infarction population these days. It is a population with that is older, lots of comorbidities. We are seeing tons of sepsis, renal failure, need for mechanical ventilation. And then you see that our structuralists need patients to be optimized prior to their interventions and then have specific needs after their interventions. And then we've seen the whole world of mechanical circulatory support explode. And I think that the population we're serving is different now in a cardiac ICU. The uh, demands on the skill set that are required are inherently uh, changing. And that it's a lot to ask a certainly a, a general cardiologist to, uh, to be able to master all of those skills. And then to think of our critical care colleagues who are traditionally uh, pulmonology trained or anesthesia trained, that now to understand all of our structural interventions, all of our mechanical circulatory support, um, this really is out of their wheelhouse. And it's in, in the wheelhouse of cardiology. And we should own this, but we should recognize that it needs an additional skill set. And I think that one of those skill sets that is very logical is intervention. Um, we still have a huge population with coronary disease and appropriate revascularization strategies are, are, are paramount in that population. And then understanding mechanical circulatory support, how it's placed, how it's managed, um, all of that falls uh, under you know, the Venn diagram of where an interventionalist and a critical care provider can overlap. And I think you can see that you make a good argument also for heart failure. But I think that the skill set that an interventionalist brings to cardiac ICU these days is becoming increasingly more important. And But we can't just sit back and expect that we can manage these complex patients with just an interventional skill set. We certainly, I think, need formal critical care training in addition. Yeah, so let me ask you a question, and because uh, I think it's it's an argument we propose in the manuscript, and um, you know, I'm I, this is an evolving area of uh, of training and um, imbibing additional skill set. Uh, so uh, the, the question is, do you think that um, getting the requisite skill sets? Um, so as a cardiology fellow, if you identify yourself as an interventional intensivist, and then if you can schedule some rotations within the construct of a three-year general cardiology fellowship program to, to, to garner additional skills in, in critical care medicine, could then this pathway be just a four-year general cardiology slash interventional intensivist pathway? Do, do you foresee that coming, or you think you need three years as a general cardiology a fellow followed by a year of critical care medicine uh, and a year of uh, interventional cardiology training? It's a, it's a very good question. And I know that this has been the subject of debate that you're writing about this. Uh, David Morrow has written about this. And, and obviously, the uh, ACC community is interested in this. I think that I don't know that I know the absolute answer here. I do think, though, that you have to have at least one year of interventional cardiology dedicated uninterrupted and that you have to have a dedicated critical care year. And what I think that then the question becomes, well, do you have to have three years of general cardiology? And I think that that probably that's where I would look to say, could you cut out some time or training? I don't think that it can be that you're minimizing any of your interventional training. And I still think that you probably need, in order to get the airway exposure, to get the exposure to uh, the medicine population, the updated uh, management of sepsis, ARDS, hypoxemic respiratory failure. Um, and then you need to have exposure to the neuro ICU. And for cardiologists, I think the CV ICU, where we have our pre or our post-op surgical patients, I think that that really does require a year of dedicated time. And so 
I don't know that you could get away from those two years. Maybe we could we could finagle uh, doing a four year pathway with one less year of general cardiology. Yeah. So, and that would uh, make you board eligible for general cardiology, for critical care medicine, and for interventional cardiology, right? Yes. And th- which is now, as of a few weeks ago, luckily what I'm boarded in, and then also an echo. Um, and I think that that is in order to to have a role in this space moving forward at a tertiary or quaternary care center, I think that you will have to, or at least especially if you want to be in any sort of administrative overseeing the the future of a cardiac ICU and sort of that role that you have to be boarded in general cardiology intervention and in critical care. Yes. You know, it's, it's, it's evolving. It's also fascinating. I think, um, I mean, uh, you, you know, my, my friend and colleague Shashank Sena has, uh, you know, uh, several years ago, I, I think a few years ago now, you probably would know about this publication. It came out in CERC Outcomes, uh, published a paper looking at the changing demographic of the cardiac intensive care unit. And uh, I mean, you would know more than any of us. I mean, when I say us, you know, I'm including, uh, you know, general cardiologists or even interventionists who spend most of their their, their days in, in the cath lab and even their clinics are evaluating patients with either complex coronary or complex structural heart or valve disease. Uh, in the cardiac ICU, you, you're, there, is a, there is a growing population of patients who have a lot of medical comorbidities, right? Absolutely. So I think that actually, Uncle, this is well published. I'm sorry, but that, you know, I think in about the 2013, 2014 range, there is from, published from many centers that the non-cardiac diagnoses in a cardiac ICU rose above 50% kind of in the mid 2010s. And so that actually in our cardiac ICU, uh, the primary reason that people are there these days is actually non-cardiac. They have cardiac issues, which is what lands them in the, in the CCU, but they are more often than not uh, have non-cardiac issues. And, you know, just educate the, uh, the listenership and the audience on this. Um, are there published data or literature on, you know, how well um, a cardiologist versus an intensivist manages, you know, severe sepsis or septic shock or, you know, vasopressor of choice or you know, even ventilatory management and, you know, pulmonary toileting and, or, you know, a management of, um, you know, ARDS, uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and, you know, the, uh, the appropriate ventilatory strategies that are required for managing these conditions. Are there data on this, uh, you know, looking at cardiologists versus a non cardiologist or an in, intensivist managing these conditions? That's a, it's a really good question. Most of the data has just focused on whether or not having an intensivist present in addition to a cardiologist, whether that's in one person or in two people, um, whether there is benefit of having an intensivist. And most of that data is out of single centers. It's prospective um, or retrospective data that has shown that certainly patient satisfaction is improved and actually in a small number of series that outcomes, including ICU times and mortality, actually are improved if you have uh, a dedicated intensivist. At this point, I don't know of any data, it's a great question, that would look at someone like me compared to another intensivist saying, does someone who has the cardiac skill set, the cardiology skill set, but also cardiac critical care, do we do at least as well as a uh, pulm critical care or anesthesia critical care? And I think that the, uh, the very frank answer there is that uh, there are not very many people like uh, me at this point. There certainly are not many interventional uh, intensivists. There are now a growing number. Uh, I think the Cleveland Clinic were in the kind of we've been educated about eight of us now. Um, so we're getting to where we have a, a, a small number of cardiac intensivists. But I think that asking for data for how well we perform compared to others, uh, there's just not enough of us at this point to really have, that would be a study of like Anne Gage plus seven others from the Cleveland Clinic and, you know, another dozen people from around the country right now. Yes, I, but I, I do think it would be a, a very important study to do. I would be interested in even even when in our own institution, um, I, I, I think that I'm very proactive about 
managing uh, the ventilator. I am very aggressive about weaning. I uh, am much more likely, I think, to, uh, but again, this is not supported by any, this is anecdotal at this point. I am more comfortable uh, extubating someone because I have the skill set to reintubate. And when you're someone who doesn't have that skill set, you are any of my wonderful colleagues, um, the majority of them, extubation becomes a much more terrifying thing to do when you can't uh, fix the, if it's a mistake, you can't fix it. And so I, I think that it's a very good point you raised that it would be interesting to even look at ventilator days, time to extubation, et cetera, from you know, the two of us that we have currently at the Cleveland Clinic in our IC compared to some of our other ICU staff who don't have critical care training. Yes, you know, I think if if, um, if you'd be interested to do that study, I'd be interested in it uh, as well. And, you know, we could, we, you know, within the within within our health system, within the clinic system wh- where we have the luxury of the main campus and then we have uh, the regional hospitals where, you know, we, we take care of equally sick patients. And, you know, we, for example, at, at my hospital, at, at Cleveland Clinic Akron General, the CCU uh, is is a co-management model where, you know, if we need help with ventilatory management or management of severe sepsis and septic shock, we rely heavily on our pulmonary colleagues. Um, so, you know, we could, we could, uh, you know, I think it would be easy to construct uh, an intervention arm and a control arm. Yes. And I think that exciting that we're involved, that people have this interest now, like that you and I have, and that we couldn't have done this, those sorts of studies, I think even three or four years ago, even at a place as big as ours, because there weren't people who uh, had this training. And so it's, I think it's an exciting time. And I think we're seeing the growth of this because now we can start to ask these questions and I think we can start to put some data behind them. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to I'm gonna hit you up on this, and uh, you know, once uh, once we're done recording, and you know, as we as we uh, I love it <laughs> as we move forward. Uh, so, just uh, a few closing remarks. You know, I want you to comment on uh, first up, um, people who want to emulate your pathway. Um, what are the strategies that they should follow? That's that's one, and two. Um, in about five years, where do you see the future of, of cardiac intensive care? I mean, did you see that the CCUs would be managed primarily by by people like yourself? Sure. So I think with respect to the first question of how do you pursue this training, there are more and more options for this. And the uh, lots of large centers across the United States and then in Canada, Canada is actually, frankly, much farther along uh, in the cardiac critical care training pathway than we are in America. But all you have to do, I think, is express an interest and uh, then get yourself into the cardiac ICU as much as you can. I think that if you want to do interventional cardiology, you need to figure out whether or not you feel that you need structural and or peripheral training also. That means that then that helps dictate what your training options are as far as interventional programs, because programs are, are, are obviously have different training pathways when it comes to intervention. So I think that if as an interventional intensivist, you figure out what the skill set is that you think that you need, and then you have to look for a program that, that will fulfill that. I think that that has to be done first and then followed by critical care. The Lots of places will allow you to, to do those things uh, um, you know, to come into the same program and allow you to accomplish all of that at one place. But I think that at this point in the game, you have to be flexible that you may not necessarily uh, be able to achieve all of this training at one institution. And I think that as we move forward, there will be more places where you have the opportunity to get all of the training in the same place. But I'm not sure that we're there yet. And As far as where the future of the cardiac ICU is in five years, I think that that's interesting, and I think it depends on what kind of institution you're talking about. The At a large tertiary or quaternary care center, I think that in five years, and certainly in 10 years, I think that 
everyone being hired to work in those in those ICUs will have formal cardiac critical care training and that they will be boarded in critical care medicine. I say that because I think that as we uh, require the additional skill set of bronchoscopy, ventilator management, and some more dedicated mechanical circulatory support time, uh, that you're going to have to be boarded in critical care. But I think that when you look at, you know, as we are with cardiogenic shock right now, moving towards a hub and spoke model, every ICU, every regional center, every, uh, you know, regional smaller community hospital, I don't think that those uh, hospitals will necessarily have to have uh, all of their ICU physicians or cardiac ICU physicians be critical care physicians. I think you will probably have one or two of them on staff, but I still think that there will be a huge role for general cardiologists or subspecialty cardiologists to manage those ICUs and to take care, excellent care of patients in that, in those places. I think it's really about when you start the need for escalation of care with cardiogenic shock and mechanical circulatory support and hypoxemic respiratory failure, when you're moving towards the hub, uh, uh, the hub of that model, the, the physicians you'll encounter there will have critical care training. Excellent. Um, and this has been a very fascinating talk. It, you know, for me, I'm sure it, it, I hope it will be for the audience. Um, and, you know, thank you for taking us through, through our journey. And I congratulate you for all that you've achieved. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks for uh, allowing me the forum to talk about this. I, it's an exciting time and an exciting kind of new niche in cardiology. Absolutely. Well, and thanks again. Thanks for your time on the weekend. And um, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Ankur. Yeah. You too. Bye-bye. Dear cardiologists, we want to make this podcast about you and for you. So please email us your critical thoughts, comments and questions at podcast at radcliffe-group.com and visit uscjournal.com for more information. You can also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook and Instagram at Radcliffe Cardiology for daily updates. Join thousands of cardiologists and become a Radcliffian by registering to radcliffecardiology.com. You will receive regular newsletters and gain access to hundreds of expert interviews, educational webinars, clinical cases, and peer-reviewed articles from our six medical review journals on general cardiology, interventional cardiology, arrhythmia and electrophysiology, cardiac failure, and vascular and endovascular surgery. Thank you.